Okay, this is the fourteenth lecture on single tuned circuits. Now, <clears throat> before I do single tuned circuits, there are a couple of things which are left from the previous lecture. Let me recall what I did in a hurry at the last moment in the previous lecture. That was about an all pass, all pass network function all pass network function and he said <coughs> that a network function will be all pass if the poles are the mirror images of the zeros and since poles have to be in the left half plane poles have to be in the left half plane if we have poles like this then zeros which are mirror images of these poles with the geomega axis considered as a mirror this acts as an all pass function and <clears throat> this is a second order two poles and two zeros a first order one would be with first order one can have a pole only on the real axis. So, a first order one would be like this a pole here and a pole zero and a zero here this is first order whereas, the black one is the second order transfer function. Similarly, you could have third order if you have all the three poles and all the three zeros this will be a third order. Similarly, you could go on increasing the order. The characteristic is that the that the poles must be mirror images of the zeros. Now <coughs> and therefore, it is of necessity all pass functions are of necessity non minimum phase functions. Okay. A minimum phase function is one whose zeros are restricted to the left half of the S plane, okay? Left half of the S plane. The border line that is between the border line that is geomega axis. If you have zeros on the geomega <coughs> axis, this is also called a non minimum phase function, okay? A minimum phase function should have zeros in the open left half plane. Is the sentence clear? Open left half plane that is geomega axis is excluded all zeros for minimum phase function should be in the open left half plane whereas, a non minimum phase function can have zeros anywhere including the geomega axis. So, an all pass network function is necessarily a non minimum phase function. Let us look at the second order all pass function in a little more details. Let us say we have another point that needs to be clarified. An all pass function cannot be a driving point function. An all pass function cannot be a driving point function or the other way around a driving point function cannot be all pass. Why? If you have an impedance which is like this which has zeros in the right half plane then obviously, the admittance shall have zeros shall have poles in the right half plane which means that the admittance will be unstable while well, this cannot be driving point impedances of necessity have to have their poles and zeros all in the left half plane. However, a driving point function can have zeros on the geomega axis it can have poles also on the geomega axis, but not in the right half plane all right. So, an all pass function cannot be a driving point function all pass function network function must of necessity be a transfer function. Okay. Now, let us look at this second order case in a little more details and to be specific what we did was we took an example uh, <coughs> a simple example like this we took zeros here where uh, this distance is 1 and uh, this distance is also 1 this is j 1. So, this is minus j 1 and then the poles are somewhere here a very simple example the transfer function the all pass function f of s will now be <coughs> equal to s plus 1 no I beg your pardon s minus 1 plus j 1 let me write it again here f of s would be the pole factors that is s plus 1 plus j 1 you understand why plus 1 comes in the denominator because the location of the pole is minus 1 
plus minus j 1 and the other factor would be s plus 1 minus j 1 and the numerator it will be s minus 1 plus j 1 s minus 1 minus j 1. Okay. In addition we can have you can have a constant multiplying factor which can be chosen at will. So, we do not we do not pay attention to this and if you simplify this <coughs> you notice that this is s minus 1 whole squared plus 1 divided by s plus 1 whole squared plus 1. Okay. It is a real quantity it is a real rational function and if you put s equal to g omega but before that let us simplify this you see that this is s square plus 1 minus plus 2 minus 2 s and s square plus 2 plus 2 s. You understand why this 2 comes from s plus 1 whole squared and 1 and another 1 which is addition and therefore, f of j omega is equal to 2 minus omega square minus j 2 omega divided by 2 minus omega square plus j 2 omega all right <coughs> and the magnitude you can see the magnitude squared is equal to 2 minus omega squared whole squared plus 2 omega whole squared divided by 2 minus omega squared whole squared plus 2 omega whole squared and this is identically equal to 1 for all omega irrespective of the value of omega which proves that it is all pass. Okay. It does not discriminate as far as magnitude is concerned it does not discriminate against any frequency. On the other hand if you find the angle the angle of f of j omega is given by the angle of the numerator which is minus tan inverse 2 omega divided by 2 minus omega squared. Have I done this correctly 2 minus omega squared and the angle of the denominator is the same and therefore, we simply all that we have to do is to take a factor of 2 here. Okay. And if I now plot the angle versus omega angle versus omega then you see at omega equal to 0 the angle is 0 all right omega equal to 0 the angle is 0 <coughs> at omega at omega equal to omega squared equal to 2 that is omega equal to root 2 the angle is minus, minus pi by 4 the negative sign is important minus pi by 4 minus pi. Minus pi. Minus pi. oh minus pi I beg your pardon tan inverse infinity pi by 2 multiplied by 2 perfectly all right this is minus pi and then when omega goes to infinity the angle is again 0 it is minus pi and therefore, the curve must be continuous. So, at infinity it goes to not 0, but minus 2 pi this is this must be understood the angle is always negative. So, it starts from it starts from here minus from 0 to minus pi and then it goes to minus 2 pi not plus 2 pi the angle of the, the direction of rotation is important all right okay so this is this is the second order function <coughs> yes so you told that the phase function lies always be minus pi and pi no i never said that no that is not correct the phase could be as large as 6 pi 8 pi why not okay phase depends on the order of the function. So, so, what if it goes to 0 it can also go to 0? Sure, it can also go to 0 phase can have can have non monotonicity it can go like this for I can devise a function in which the phase goes like this shows the minimum and then comes to 0 sure the phase behavior is not restricted all right. In this case also it can go to 0. Where? So, at infinity it goes to minus 2 pi minus 2 pi is the same as 0 as far as its sine cosine tangent cotangent or any function is concerned, but one must realize that the phase is always negative and therefore, this 0 here means minus 2 pi. Similarly, plus 2 pi also is 0 
plus 4 pi is also equivalent to 0 because you take any trigonometric function, so the value is this the same. This negative has come because of the minus sign? That is correct. So, uh, so, so but as omega is tending towards infinity. Correct. This is the phase angle inside will be tending towards negative 0. That means from opposite side, that means minus 2 pi. And this minus will make it plus 2 pi. Absolutely wonderful. <coughs> you see, look at this. I expected, I was expecting this question much earlier. You see when omega squared is less than 2, then this quantity is positive and therefore the phase is negative. But when omega squared goes beyond 2, what happens? So, it becomes negative, so, we are so the phase, phase will become phase. positive yes, sir. and therefore at omega squared equal to 2, there will be a transition yes. in phase and all this is wrong. Yes. Agreed? Yes. All this is wrong. At omega, at omega squared is 2 minus the phase is negative. Omega squared 2 plus the phase is positive and therefore there is an abrupt change through minus pi to plus pi. Alright? So, this is wrong. You correct it. Incidentally, it's also wrongly given in the textbook. All right, check and correct this. We next consider the main topic of the day, that is the single tuned circuit. Single tuned circuit is a circuit in which there is one inductor and one capacitor connected in a certain fashion, so that they resonate that is <coughs> the reactance of the inductor is positive the reactance of the capacitor is negative and the two can conspire to show no reactance outside at a particular frequency this as you know is the phenomenon of resonance resonance also goes by the name tuning and single tuned circuit means we are considering a resonance circuit which has resonance at only one frequency, single tuned. We can have double tuned circuits also, we can have two resonances as you shall see later, but that will require more reactive elements. A single tuned circuit is formed by one inductor and one capacitor. And usually a single tuned circuit is interesting only if it produces a pair of complex conjugate poles. Otherwise, it is not very, very interesting. If a single tune, single tune circuit, you know the resistance, inductance and capacitance can be such that the circuit is over damped. If it is over damped, the poles are on the negative real axis and that case is not, is not of much interest. You understand what I mean? I have already taken the differential equation of a series RLC circuit and showed that the, that the natural frequencies can be either complex or can be real. If they are real, they should lie on the negative real axis. And if in the case of an overdamped circuit or the critically, the critically damped means both the uh, natural frequencies are on the negative real axis at a particular point, coincident at a particular point, all right, which happens when R squared equal to 4 uh, L by C. I think that is the Is that correct? Yes. Sir. Okay. Now, if the resistance, we will find out in a moment. If the resistance goes below this, then we have complex conjugate poles. And this is complex conjugate natural frequencies. And this is the case that is of interest as far as single tuned circuit is concerned or any circuit for that matter, any electrical engineering circuit where you want to produce a band pass type of response. That is where you want to select a particular band of frequencies around the center frequency, a single tuned circuit with complex conjugate poles is of interest. So, let us look at complex conjugate poles <coughs> and introduce some nomenclature. Here is pair of a pair of complex conjugate poles. Okay. Let us say this is J beta, this is minus J beta and let us say this is minus alpha. So, the poles are at minus alpha plus minus j beta. 
all right it is conventional to characterize these poles instead of writing p 1 2 equal to minus alpha plus j beta it is conventional to to characterize these poles by means of two parameters called omega n the undamped natural frequency undamped natural frequency and the other is zeta the damping factor and they are defined like this. These uh, definitions would be pretty standard and you shall use this in control in communications and anywhere that resonance circuits are used anywhere there is a question of selectivity omega n and zeta this term shall be used they are defined like this uh, draw the radius vector from the origin to one of the poles any pole okay let us say the upper upper pole then the length of this line is called omega n the length of this line is called the undamped natural frequency omega n and obviously omega n is equal to square root of alpha squared plus beta squared isn't that right this this in this triangle in this triangle this angle is 90 and therefore the hypotenuse squared is equal to alpha squared plus beta squared or omega n squared equal to alpha squared plus beta squared and this angle this angle that it makes with the negative real axis is called is given the name theta and zeta no sign it is just the magnitude the value forget about sign this angle theta zeta is defined as cosine of theta all right zeta is defined as cosine of this angle the uh, damping factor zeta is defined as cosine of this angle and therefore we can express alpha and beta in terms of omega n and zeta okay for example if you look at the figure don't you see that alpha just the value alpha is simply omega n the hypotenuse multiplied by cosine theta that is simply equal to zeta omega n all right and beta is equal to omega n times sin theta that is equal to omega n under root of 1 minus zeta squared okay so the location of the roots alpha and beta are expressed in terms of zeta and omega n in this fashion otherwise also you see the the polynomial the denominator if these are poles then the denominator polynomial of the transfer function would be of the form s plus alpha plus j beta s plus alpha minus j beta and this is obviously equal to s squared plus twice alpha s plus alpha squared plus beta squared all right and this is written as alpha s squared plus zeta omega n s plus omega n squared alpha squared plus beta squared you have already found out to be equal to omega n squared and therefore there is a factor of 2 here twice zeta omega n s plus omega n squared so zeta is equal to zeta is equal to how much zeta omega n is alpha therefore it is alpha divided by omega n all right this is the relationship between zeta alpha and omega n okay 2 alpha is equal to 2 zeta omega n and therefore zeta is equal to alpha divided by omega n is that point clear okay if you find the roots of this the roots the, the if you find the roots of this polynomial what do you find if you find the roots of this polynomial s squared plus twice zeta omega n s plus omega n squared where are the roots minus 2 zeta omega n plus minus square root of 4 zeta squared omega n squared minus 4 omega n squared divided by 2 and therefore this is minus zeta omega n plus minus j 
omega n under root of 1 minus zeta squared. Why did I take j out? Because as I said otherwise the case is of no interest. If j is not taken out, if this is greater than this then we lose interest in the pair of poles. It is only when they are complex conjugate that interests us and you see that this is equal to alpha. Therefore, alpha is obviously equal to zeta omega n and beta equal to omega n square root 1 minus zeta square the same as we derived previously in terms of the angle theta <coughs> and the radius factor which was omega n. All right, the thing to remember to summarize <coughs> the thing to remember is that the nat undamped natural frequency is given by alpha squared plus beta squared and zeta is equal to in terms of alpha and omega n it is alpha divided by omega n which is equal to alpha divided by square root of alpha squared plus beta square. We shall require these relations again and again not only in this course, but also in control and communications. <coughs> Any question at this point? Okay. If there are no questions, let us look at this figure again. Sigma j omega. We have a pair of poles and as I said, this angle is theta. when theta tends to pi by 2, when theta tends to pi by 2 the poles move close to the j omega axis and zeta then tends to 0, zeta tends to 0. If theta tends to pi by 2, zeta which is cosine of pi by 2 tends to 0 and therefore the damping decreases, damping decreases as theta increases. On the other hand, when theta tends to 0, when theta tends to 0, the damping increases, damping increases and damping tends to the value 1, all right, damping tends to the value 1. As I said, this is not of interest, that is if the poles now move towards the negative real axis. Well, they could be coincident or they could separate out, but this is not of, not, not of much interest. So, there is a relationship between the damping factor zeta and the angle theta. By looking at the function, you should be able to say whether it is critically damped. For critical damping, what is the value of zeta? Pardon me? 1. Okay. If zeta, if zeta exceeds 1, then of course, the poles separate on the negative real axis and that case is of no interest. So, zeta less than 1 is under damped response, zeta greater than 1 over damped, zeta equal to 1 is critical response. Okay. So, what do we mean zeta greater than 1? Zeta greater than 1 will mean that the poles separate on the negative real axis. Okay. Now, let us look at uh, before we <coughs> before we pass to the single tuned circuit. Let us look at the network function f of s. It will be some constant k divided by s squared plus twice zeta omega n s plus omega n squared. Complex conjugate poles are always represented in terms of zeta and omega n. Now, if you look at the magnitude response capital F of j omega. If you look at the magnitude response, let us make k equal to omega n squared for simplicity. If you look at the magnitude response obviously, at omega equal to 0 it starts from 1 and then and then it can go like this, it can go like this or it can go like this depending on the value of zeta all right. And the case is of interest only when zeta is such that there occurs a peaking there occurs a peaking all right as zeta decreases as zeta decreases the peaking goes on increasing when zeta is equal to 0 then then the amplitude goes to infinity 
amplitude goes to infinity at what frequency? Omega n. Isn't that right? When zeta goes to 0, the denominator becomes omega n squared minus omega squared. So at omega equal to omega n, the amplitude, the magnitude goes to infinity. And this is why omega n is called the undamped natural frequency. That is if there is no damping, then this is the frequency at which this circuit will show infinite magnitude, infinite amount of selectivity. Is the point clear? Alright. If we look at the phase, we will find out for what value of zeta it is critically damped, I mean the magnitude response. Our critical damping, if you recall, these terms under damped, over damped and critical damping was with respect to what? With respect to? Yes, but response in which domain? No, time domain. It was in the time domain. Agreed? We showed that in the time domain, critical damping corresponds to the borderline region between oscillations and no oscillations. So it was in the time domain. In the frequency domain, when does a peaking occur? We shall investigate this point in details. That is, there will exist a value of zeta below which there will be peaking, above which there will be no peaking. And we are talking of frequency response now, it is not time domain response. All right. So things will be slightly different, but we shall be able to find out. Again, before we go to the actual circuit, let us look at the phase response. We have omega n squared divided by s squared plus twice zeta omega n s plus omega n squared. The phase response, all right. <clears throat> As you see, when s is 0, when the frequency is 0, phi omega, when the frequency is 0, what is the phase? Phase is 0, okay. So it starts from 0. And then at omega equal to omega n, the phase if zeta is small, if zeta was 0 at omega equal to omega n, the phase goes through a jump of how many degrees? We have already explained this that if we have s squared plus alpha 2 squared in the denominator, then the jump is through minus 180 and therefore at omega near omega equal to omega n zeta is small zeta is not exactly 0 it goes through a jump like this what happens at omega equal to infinity at omega equal to infinity the the function behaves like omega n squared by minus omega squared and therefore it must go to minus pi all right. Take it with a pinch of salt and correct it. All right. I don't want to explain everything in this course. There are some things which you shall have to answer. Now let's look at this circuit. <coughs> let's look at this circuit. We have a single tuned circuit is a resistance inductance in series there are various forms we take a typical form and a capacitor c this is my transform of the of the input voltage and this is my output voltage v0s this is a typical single tuned circuit the voltage the output being taken across the capacitor uh, of value c all right there are various other forms you could take the output across l you could connect L and C in parallel and so on and so forth. Typically this resistance is that of the inductance because as you perhaps know by now capacitances can be made relatively loss free that is the resistance associated with a capacitance can be made as small the series resistance as small as possible or the parallel resistance can be made as large as one wants to. But whenever you wind the coil to make an inductance, the wire itself has a certain specific resistance and therefore you cannot make an inductance without resistance unless you go to superconducting 
temperatures. Okay, at ordinary temperatures, there must be a resistance. So this resistance may be the resistance of the inductor, or may be added externally. Okay, may be added externally. But if you take the transfer function v0 by vi, which you shall now call h of s, obviously this is equal to one over sc divided by r plus sl plus one over sc, which I can write as one by s squared lc plus SCR plus 1 all right this can be simplified as 1 over LC 1 by S squared plus S R by L plus 1 over LC all right obviously the poles P 1 2 of this transfer function shall be minus r by 2 l plus minus square root of yes 1 by l c minus r square divided by 4 l square is that okay times j otherwise it is not of interest all right if it cannot produce complex conjugate poles then it is not of interest all right so this is equal to minus alpha plus minus j beta all right the point that we are looking for is now where is the amplitude a maximum all right but before that before that we can calculate the magnitude of this function and the phase by graphical methods that is what we do is we have a pair of poles like this this is in a sense repetition but it is worth doing okay this is my uh, this is j beta and this is minus alpha and we take a certain frequency let us say somewhere here let us say let us say this is j omega and we want to find out the magnitude at this frequency. <coughs> so what we do is we draw a vector from this pole to this point and we draw another vector from this pole to this point all right. We call this as m1 and this as m2. So, my transfer function magnitude h of j omega would be simply would be simply the constant k which was 1 by l c k equal to 1 by l c how is it related to alpha alpha and beta the constant k is equal to 1 by l c how is it related to alpha and beta it is simply alpha squared plus beta squared which means that it is equal to omega n squared okay. <coughs> so let us forget about that k is 1 by l c so it is k divided by m 1 m 2 that is it the magnitude and if you notice the magnitude well m 1 you can find out geometrically m 1 is how much is this distance it is omega plus beta not j beta the distance I am trying to find this the hypotenuse of this right angle triangle this distance the perpendicular is omega plus beta this much is beta and this much is omega and this is alpha and therefore this is k well m1 is equal to square root of alpha squared plus omega plus beta whole square and in a similar manner you can find m2 to be equal to square root of alpha squared plus omega minus beta whole square is that okay right therefore <coughs> the magnitude I'll call that m <coughs> m of omega would be equal to k divided by square root of alpha squared plus omega plus beta whole squared multiplied by 
alpha squared plus omega minus beta whole square. <coughs> we want to find out where would the peak occur, where would this function be a maximum. Now to that end we square the function capital M of omega obviously has to be a positive quantity because it is a magnitude and therefore and therefore the maximum of capital M shall correspond to the maximum of M squared. Is the point clear? Therefore what we do is we find out M squared and that I can write as notice this alpha squared plus beta squared plus omega squared plus twice omega beta k squared all right multiplied by alpha squared plus beta squared plus omega squared minus twice omega beta all right. Now you can you can simplify this to the following you can write this as k squared divided by <coughs> omega to the fourth you can see where from it comes from plus omega squared 2 omega squared alpha squared minus beta squared plus alpha squared plus beta squared whole squared this is as simple as that alright. <coughs> and we are interested in the maximum of capital M you can go ahead and differentiate with respect to omega squared because this can be treated as a function of omega squared and find out the frequency of maximum. A simpler way rather than differentiating would be to look at the denominator. Okay. Let me repeat these are some tricks of the trade which you should, we should, you should have learnt in high school class 10, class 10 or earlier. Of course, no differentiation is taught there, but one is often acquaint, one is often encountered, one often encounters the problem of maximizing or minimizing. Now, this the denominator of this can be written as omega squared plus alpha squared minus beta squared whole squared, okay. then plus alpha squared this is the denominator alpha squared plus beta squared whole squared minus alpha squared minus beta squared whole squared. Agree? Make it a whole square so that omega square terms in, comes inside and this quantity as you can see it is 4 alpha squared beta squared a constant. It does not vary with frequency. This is the term that varies with frequency and because it is a whole square it cannot be negative and therefore the minimum value of this will occur when this is equal to zero. 0 and that occurs at omega squared is equal to this is equal to 0 so it should be beta squared minus alpha squared and since this is the frequency of maximum we put a subscript of m here omega m squared equal to beta squared minus alpha squared. Now we have done a quite quite a bit of mathematics, simple algebra, but you must not lose sight of what you are doing. What you are doing, this is the frequency at which the denominator is a minimum, and therefore m squared will be maximum, and therefore this will be the frequency of peak if at all there is a peak. If at all. You see, you notice that if beta is greater than alpha, which means that the imaginary part of the root is greater than the real part then obviously omega m shall have a value. On the other hand if alpha is equal to beta that is if the root is such if the pole is such that is real part and imaginary part are equal then obviously this maximum occurs at the origin at omega equal to 0. What does that mean? Maximum occurs here and then it falls so it is a case of a low pass filter if beta is equal to alpha it gives you a low pass filter. On the other hand if beta is greater than alpha I am sorry if beta is less than alpha then omega m squared is negative 
omega m becomes imaginary which means that there is no maximum, no maximum exists. Is that ok? So, for a maximum beta must be greater than alpha, beta cannot be equal to alpha because then the maximum occurs at omega equal to 0 which is a low pass filter alright. Only when beta is greater than alpha we shall get a peaking like this agree. Now, let us look at this expression in terms of zeta we have shown that the maximum occurs at a frequency omega m squared equal to beta squared minus alpha squared. We want to put this in terms of zeta that is the damping coefficient. Well, I can write this as there are many ways of doing this, but <coughs> I do it like this. I write this as beta squared plus alpha squared minus 2 alpha squared all right and I can write this as beta squared plus alpha squared take common 1 minus 2 alpha squared divided by beta squared plus alpha squared. I write this as beta squared plus alpha squared obviously is omega n squared if you recall and inside bracket minus 2 alpha squared plus beta squared plus alpha squared. If you re recall alpha by square root of beta squared plus alpha squared is zeta the damping coefficient and therefore 1 minus 2 zeta square is it ok. So, my omega m square the frequency of maximum is related to the natural frequency undamped natural frequency by this relation 1 minus 2 zeta squared. And now we can interpret the concepts, we can interpret the results that we got in terms of alpha and beta in terms of zeta now a single variable ok. You notice that there will be a peak provided 2 zeta squared is less than 1 ok. So, if I recall omega m squared is omega n squared 1 minus 2 zeta squared then peak occurs if zeta is less than 1 by root 2. Is that clear? What happens if zeta is equal to 1 by root 2? It becomes a low pass filter all right that is maximum occurs but maximum at 0. No peak if zeta is 1 by zeta greater than 1 by root 2 and low pass filter if zeta equal to 1 by root 2. So, the damping coefficient now characterizes the frequency response also, but the critical values are not the same as in the time domain. In the time domain zeta equal to 1 is it ok? In the time domain I gave a pause because there is a distance between time domain and frequency domain. There should be some time gap between the time domain and frequency domain. Zeta equal to 1 was the critical damping value in the time domain. <coughs> what did that mean? It meant that if zeta is less than 1 the step response will show oscillations. If zeta is greater than 1 step response will not show oscillations. On the other hand the critical value here is 1 by root 2 which is 0 0.707 alright. If zeta is less than 0 0.707 there will be a peaking, if zeta is less than 0.707 I am sorry, if zeta is less than 0 0.707 there will be peaking, if zeta is greater than 0 0.707 there shall be no peaking and therefore, <coughs> these figures should be imprinted in your mind. Where do you start from? You start from 1 and this is omega, this is magnitude function. Zeta equal to 1 by root 2 is something like this, zeta greater than 1 by root 2 will you will have a shape like this and zeta less than 1 by root 2 you will have a shape like this all right. <coughs> so, zeta equal to 1 by root 2 this is a case of interest. It is a case of interest not only because it, is, it defines a critical damping in the frequency domain, but also because of another characteristic. You see zeta equal to 1 by root 2 
<coughs> what is the slope at omega equal to 0? 0. zero. Zeta greater than 1 by root 2, the slope is positive. This condition zeta equal 1 by root 2 is known as the condition of maximal flatness or zeta equal to 0 0.707 is the condition for maximally flat response. Beyond this the slope is negative ok. All right. <coughs> And um, omega m is equal to omega m is equal to let us recall the value beta squared minus alpha squared and in terms of the natural frequency of oscillation this is omega m squared 1 minus 2 zeta squared. This result that is the maximum can also be visualized graphically that is you have the the s plane sigma j omega let us say we have the poles at at j beta minus alpha ok. Now look at this geometric construction suppose with this point as the as the center and this as the radius this as the radius what is the radius radius equal to beta you draw a circle well will this circle if beta is greater than alpha then obviously this circle will intersect the j omega axis at two points my circle is not too good nevertheless it shall do at two points one is this and the other is this and because of symmetry the intersection at this point shall be at the same distance from the origin as the intersection at this point all right. Now if I take what is this distance this is equal to beta squared minus alpha squared square root why because this is beta and this is alpha. So, this distance must be square root of beta squared minus alpha squared which is precisely equal to under root of omega n not under root precisely equal to omega n and therefore, therefore we can find out without any calculation given the pole given the two complex conjugate poles we can find out the frequency of maximum simply by drawing a circle simply by drawing a circle this is the center and this is the radius the intersection of the j omega axis gives you the frequency of maximum response. You also notice that if beta equals to alpha then this circle shall intersect the j omega axis only at a single frequency single value that is at the origin. origin which means that the j omega axis shall now be a tangent to this circle. So, beta equal to alpha maximum omega m becomes equal to 0 and if beta is greater than alpha then this circle this circle shall not intersect the j omega axis ok. I beg your pardon beta is less than alpha beta is less than alpha this circle shall not intersect the j omega axis and therefore there shall be no maximum. This is a way of visualizing the peaking or the response of a single tuned circuit or the response of a complex conjugate pair of poles. Now it is not necessary that you have physically L, C and R as you shall see later many communication channels can be modeled by a second order system. Many control systems process control there are no actual inductances or capacitances but their behavior is that of a second order system and whenever there is a second order system whenever there is a second order system uh, zeta and omega n shall come into play and this concepts that you are learning not only are true for physical circuits which you can build in the laboratory and observe the performance of the oscilloscope they are also useful for characterizing control systems communication systems, and even mechanical systems systems for transmission systems for other purposes 
even mechanical systems or acoustic systems, vibration, loudspeaker characterization or microphone, all of them can be characterized in terms of usually second order system. And there the values of zeta and omega n are of extreme importance. The point that I was mentioning now is that this circle therefore is worth a thousand words. If you draw this circle then you know whether a maximum occurs or not. If a maximum occurs at what frequency does the maximum occur and therefore this circle is given a very interesting name it is called the peaking circle P E A K I N G peaking circle. If you draw a peaking circle then you shall not only know whether peaking occurs or not you shall also know you shall also know where the peaking occurs. Now with reference to the to the location of the poles you recall that this distance is omega n and this is theta. A parameter a figure of period is defined like this you had defined q in 110 w110 in a different manner. Now we shall define q in terms of a general complex conjugate pair of poles. We are no longer associating q with an inductance or a capacitance. You know there is an energy definition of Q for an inductance and a capacitance and so on. There is also a definition for a bandpass circuit or for a selective circuit in terms of the selectivity that is the maximum frequency of maximum divided by the bandwidth that is the frequency difference between two frequencies at which the response is 70.7 percent that is 1 by root 2 or in terms of decibels, 3 decibels down, we are giving yet another definition of Q. And in usual circumstances, this definition shall give you the same results as any other definition under usual circumstances. It is, it is defined as 1 over 2 zeta, as simple as that, 1 over 2 zeta which is equal to 1 over 2 cosine theta, all right. <coughs> and Q is, is a figure of merit before we go into the details of Q let us ask some very elementary questions what happens when the poles go towards the imaginary axis Q increases if the poles lie exactly on the imaginary axis then what is the value of Q infinity, infinity. Now if the poles lie exactly on the g omega axis do not you recall that the <coughs> magnitude goes to infinity? If the magnitude goes to infinity where are the 3dB points? Infinity is similarly close to that and therefore Q the magnitude goes to infinity and the bandwidth becomes approximately 0 and therefore Q goes to infinity. On the other hand on the other hand if zeta is less than I am sorry, if zeta is greater than 1 by root 2, what does it mean? This angle is less than 45, <coughs> then there will be no peaking and therefore theta equal to 45 is the critical angle, is the critical angle. If theta exceeds 45, there shall be peaking. If theta is lower than 45, there shall be no peaking. So theta is another way of characterizing the figure of merit Q. All right, peaking and no peaking. If theta tends to 0, there is a definition of Q, Q becomes equal to half. If theta tends to 0, zeta tends to 1, Q becomes equal to half, but it cannot be interpreted in terms of a selective response. Why not? Because there is no peaking. All right, the definition of Q still stands, but it loses its physical meaning. We shall continue this on Friday.